we go straight into the book um, and if we just click on the first link you can just continually do next and previous to go through the pages on this book or um, just go up to for the latest section or home for the page we've just come from. So there's a bit of description about um, how Linux from scratch came about from the chap who instigated it originally, Jared Beekmans. Um, there's a bit about the intended audience. So I won't go through all this. You can read it at your own leisure. I, I definitely recommend reading the whole of the book uh, at least once before you attempt to build Linux from scratch. Um, maybe not so much the parts where you're compiling, although that that some of them are interesting to read. A lot of them are the same instru or similar instructions to compile. See a pattern coming through, maybe some slight variations. Um, there are some of the bigger ones, for example, the compiler GCC, where the instructions are quite a lot different to other packages. Um, there's lots of extra work to be done there, so they're they're worth a good read. But generally, the packages themselves probably not worth worrying about too much. But certainly, everything else else around the instructions to build individual packages it is definitely worth reading at least once, maybe two or three times, till you till you've got an idea in your head how. Um, the Linux from scratch build actually works because it can be a little bit daunting, a little bit confusing um, on the first time around. Um, so yeah, that's uh, as I say, definitely worth doing. So target architectures. Now this is uh, quite important to read really because it says here in the first sentence the primary target of the LFS of LFS are the AMD and Intel 32-bit and 64-bit CPUs. So straight away they're saying that that's really all they're supporting. Obviously uh, Raspberry Pis, they built on ARM architecture which is a completely different technology. Um, so on the second sentence it does, had, uh, it does say that on the other hand these instructions are known to work on different technologies so they've got PowerPC and the ARM CPUs. Um, to build a system that utilizes one of these CPUs, the main prerequisite, in addition to those on the next page, is an existing system such as an earlier LFS installation. So, uh, in case you haven't already realized, I haven't actually mentioned, I'm actually um, displaying this on the Raspberry Pi. You can see the little Raspberry Pi logo there on the uh, menu button there. So, I, I'm actually going to be using the Raspberry Pi operating system to build Linux from scratch, so we've actually fulfilled this this requirement. Um, but it does suggest that there may be other distributions. I, I am aware that there are other distributions that are now supporting the Raspberry Pi. There's quite a few supporting them. Um, also note that a 32-bit distribution can be installed and used as a host on a 64-bit in AMD or Intel. Okay, so that doesn't count here. And it gives some uh, approximate times of um, building the system um, again this is just for the um, x86 uh, technologies um, I have to say the Raspberry Pi 400 is a fairly nippy thing um, I, I've i tried building Raspberry Pi years ago on the original Raspberry Pi when it first came out and it was quite slow I think that only runs at 600 or 700 megahertz and I only had a single core as well, and it was um, fairly slow. Um, I can't remember exactly how long it took, but it, in total it was probably equivalent of maybe 24 hours solid. Um, as I remember, it was certainly over a few days. It wasn't something that could get in a day. Um, this machine is with four cores, the processor, um, and at the 1.8 gigahertz speed, um, during testing, uh, it was, I don't know, it's probably maybe with the tests as well, running the um, package tests, probably anything up to about 10 hours, I guess, in total. Um, it was quite fast. It's not the fastest in the world, but um, it is pretty fast. I was, I was um, uh, quite, quite quietly uh, impressed really with the, with the speed of it. Um, I do own all the Raspberry Pi models but I've not really had time to dabble with them that much to get a feel for their speed. It's only really the first one when it first came out that I uh, had a good poke around with. 
So to see um, how far it's come in what eight years, I'm quite, quite impressed. Um, one thing I will say is, and we'll see this as we go into building Linux from scratch, the default SD card does slow the Raspberry Pi down a bit. It's quite a slow access. Um, and initially when I booted this up, I thought, oh, it's still quite sluggish. But once you stick a um, USB drive in, because um, it's got USB 3 ports on it, um, it really does start to fly along. So it's a bit like sticking a solid state disk into a machine that's got a spinning disk. It makes quite a bit of difference to to use faster um, storage. I've not used an SSD with it to see if that makes as much difference, but certainly I've um, I've put and I will be using an external hard disk, one of these act uh, docks actually. I'll be using. Um, I've not tried a proper USB flash. Um, card to see what that's like, but I imagine that's faster than the SD card. Um, so when when we come to actually configuring the disk, I'll, I'll mention it again. But I'd certainly recommend if you want to have a go at this and you don't want to be hanging around too much to um, consider getting an external disk to build this on. So anyway, mainly what what the point I'm making on this and the point they're making in the book is that. The only supported architectures are the 32-bit and 64-bit Intel and AMD-based um, x86 architectures, but it is possible to build on different architectures such as the ARM. And as we see, it's not a perfect build. Some of the tests failed, unfortunately. Um, but I'll point out that at the time when we come to those tests um, where uh, there are mitigating circumstances for those failures. So it's not a perfect uh, run through with a test as it would be on a x86 um, architecture, unfortunately. Um, whether that's down to the way LFS is built, whether that's down to the actual packages themselves, which I suspect is what it is, um, I don't know. But uh, you can end up with a, a system that does seem to be stable and, and works well. So. Um, We'll see that as we go through anyway. So prerequisites. So it tells you a little bit about what you require in terms of knowledge. Um, yeah, I don't. I certainly don't think you could come to build Linux from scratch without any knowledge of um, Linux or, or typing commands on the on the terminal. Um, I would suggest you do need a little bit of basic knowledge. Um, if you've used the command line before, then you should be able to get through this quite easily. Um, also, knowledge of actually Linux. Although Linux from scratch will teach you how Linux is put together, if you've got some knowledge about things like shells and binaries, and maybe even where loca locations of programs are, um, and how the Linux file system is laid out, that, that might help a little bit. But as long as you're savvy with using a computer and using command line, I think um, you should have a reasonable chance of getting through successfully. There is a chance that you'll start building and something will go wrong and it will fail and you won't know what to do. You can find out on the internet. It's, um, usually somebody's had the same problem. And if you come to a complete dead end, the best thing is just to collapse what you've done, start from scratch and hopefully you'll get through that problem. I found myself when I was learning uh, Linux and Linux from scratch. Um, that just redoing it over and over, you'll 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 realise that you've done something wrong. You'll read something differently and understand it better. Um, so you, you don't lose anything. Although you think, oh, I've lost a day doing that. I've got nowhere. Don't look at it like that. Look at it as a learning experience. That you you'll retry it. You'll go through it again. The bit you've already done through, you'll you're obviously um, be doing it a lot better because you've done it once before. So you've you've learned that bit already. Um, so don't don't see the failure of getting somewhere and having a failure as uh, a complete failure. Don't give up. Just you know, if you can't find any solutions on the internet, just have another go. Just start again from scratch, um, and hopefully you'll get through eventually. Um, and so this is what I did. I I learned. Well, I was actually taught uh, the basic um, uh, Linux system. It was like an introduction to Linux on a course. It was a week course. Um, and that's what um, 
got, got, got my interest into Linux. And from there, I, I tried to teach myself. I, I think I downloaded one of the operating systems. I think it was Red Hat 5 at the time. Um, just have a dabble around. Um, and I think it was uh, maybe about a year after that, somebody, I've read somebody mentioned Linux from scratch, and uh, that's how I got into Linux from scratch. And Linux from scratch told me a lot about Linux itself and how to use the command prompt and so on, and vice versa. I learned, the, I learned about Linux from Linux from scratch, and I learned Linux from Linux, uh, Linux from scratch from Linux, if you like. So it was a two way uh, learning thing for, for me. So I'd stick with it if you really want to learn um, about Linux and Linux from scratch, then stick with it if you have problems. So it goes through some of the standards that. Uh, Linux from scratch adheres to, which is quite good to know. Um, there's nothing worse than um, using another distribution and find they're doing something slightly differently or, you know, split packages up or things like that. Um, it can be quite annoying. You think you know where something should be and it's somewhere else. I know that Linux is all about doing things your own way, but um, sometimes, especially with system things, it's nice to know where things are that they're in the same place uh, uh, it's good that they adhere to some standards so these are the packages so you these might seem strange names initially if you've never done um, any uh, building of packages before you might have seen some being brought in if you've done package updates and other distributions but you'll get to know these package names quite well as you go through Linux from scratch um, this explains what each package is for and why it's in the book. So over the years, I have introduced more and more packages into the basic Linux from scratch book. And I imagine they've probably had people questioning why they're in there. So I guess this page is a bit of a justification as to why certain packages in, are in here. Some, for example, this one, GCC is the GNU compiler collection, are absolutely necessary. You'd never see that not in, in here because it is a compiler. Um, all right, you might see another compiler in here in its place, but um, you've got to have at least one compiler, and that's the one of choice. As you can see, most of these begin with G. That's because they're GNU packages, which is the uh, like the original um, free software that was uh, started by Richard Stallman uh, sometime in the 80s. So it's, it's why you sometimes see the Linux system is GNU Linux because it's a Linux kernel with GNU software although a lot of the software doesn't come under GNU uh, banner anymore there's um, other groups or other individuals that have written some of these other packages so as you can see there's quite a few packages we go through to install and just a little let's say explanation about what they're about next bit is bit about the topography used in the book so um, basically the commands are shown like this um, so this is what we type in anything in bold and then any output is shown in like a lighter um, font and it says there backslashes followed by immediate return so it shows that this command follows on the next line so this is all one command This formats for creating configuration files. So the actual command again is in the bold type, but the information that's being stored in this file is the information that's in the normal type. And there's some bit more here about italicized text and so on. So that's worth reading and understanding. But generally, anything that's in a grey box is stuff that you'll copy, uh, that you'll copy and paste into the terminal. So there's the structure of the book, there's five parts, introduction which we're in at the moment, preparing for the build which is quite a, can be quite complex and intensive but it's just a matter of keeping a clear mind about what you're doing and um, it's not too too hard. Then there's a bit where we prepare the build system so start compiling some of the programs and tools in this section uh, in preparation for the actual build which is in part four. And then part five is just some appendices with uh, lists and so on and indexes. And again, there's a bit about the errata. If there's any errors that are found in the book subsequently, then there's a links directly to that, that 
uh, link that we've already looked at on the web page. So introduction, how to build a Linux from scratch system. So this goes into a little bit more detail about individual chapters and what they contain, um, how it's built. So you can see chapter two is where we create the partition of the file system to hold the new um, operating system that we're going to build. Um, Chapter 3 is where we get the packages, so the actual source code um, and some patches are downloaded. Chapter 4 sets up a work environment, so there's certain things that need to be set um, and the environment on the command line needs to be configured in such a way that it's um, appropriate for what we're, the work we're going to do. Um, chapter 5, that's where we build um, an initial tool chain. And Linux from scratch, since this version, version 10.0, uses a, a true, well, almost true cross compilation technique. Um, it's not a true con cross compilation in the fact that we're building natively, i.e., we're building using the processor of the machine we're running for the, for the machine that we're running. So we're not building for a different architecture or a different processor on, on a different machine. So normally cross compilation means that you'll build, for example, on an Intel processor and you're targeting an, an ARM or an ARM processor. So in that respect, it's not a true cross, cross compilation technique, but in all other respects, it is a true cross compilation technique. So the only, only thing that makes it not a true cross compilation technique is the fact that we're building natively from, from an ARM to an ARM machine. But apart from that, they do use full cross compilation techniques um, since version 10. Previously, it was a bit, it was like half a cross compilation technique and it wasn't, um, well, I always felt personally it was a little bit of a, little bit of a kludge, um, the way they did it. It did work to some extent. Occasionally it could cause problems. You get things leaking in from the host system. Um, and obviously work well because that's a system they use for years and years, you know, well over 10 years. Um, but now they use this um, true cross compilation technique. So, as I say, it's true with the caveat that it's not actually cross compiling to a different processor. That's the only caveat. Um, it's a lot more solid. It's a lot more of a robust system. Um, so I personally am, am really glad to see that they've done this. It's uh, yeah, just knowing what, what it involves and what it's doing is, is a, a really good system they've, they've got here. So as I say, um, they're building in preparation for um, the cross compilation in chapter five. Chapter six is um, just cross compiling some basic utilities. Um, and then chapter seven is where we're going to the actual environment of some of the tools we've built and we'll just build some final tools before we go on to building the actual Linux from scratch system, which is the whole of chapter eight. So that's the biggest chapter, as that's where every single package is rebuilt, or in some cases, some packages are rebuilt, um, and others are built for the first time for the final system. And then finally, the last few chapters, chapter nine is uh, configuring the system Chapter 10 is to configure the bootloader and chapter 11 just some pointers to take the operating system beyond the basic Linux from scratch book. So at the end of this we will have a very very basic minimal system, it will boot, it will give you a chance to log in, you'll be able to log in, you'll get a prompt, a bash prompt um, and that's more or less it, They'll, you will only have the basic tools that we've built in Linux from scratch. Um, there won't be any real apps to speak of to use. Um, so that that last chapter is quite important because it does give you some pointers um, as to how to extend the system into a truly usable system, wherever you use it as a server, which is what I still use Linux from scratch for. I've got a, an old Pentium Pro machine I occasionally use as a server. Um, so. I use Linux from scratch for that. That's the only system I use it for. Now I used to use Linux from scratch as my main um, 
machine, uh, sorry, main operating system of choice until I discovered Gen 2, which is basically learned from scratch, but it's automated. Um, that's it in a nutshell. It's, it's a lot more than that, actually. Um, but I now use Gen 2 because it's still compiled from scratch, um, but just automated, so it's easier to maintain and easier to manage. But yeah, it's it's uh, certainly a very, Linux from scratch to use as a, a real operating system is excellent for a server because it's got a minimum footprint, it's got a tiny footprint, um, won't take up much disk space, takes up minimum amount of memory, and it works fine on that Pentium Pro. In fact, I've, um, if you look at some of my playlists on my channel on YouTube, you'll see I've even built Linux from scratch on a 486 uh, Intel 486 processor. So it's um, perfectly feasible to do that. Um, as regards as building on the Raspberry Pi 400, um, I won't actually stop at the end of this book because there's some things about the Raspberry Pi that um, I'll show later on when we come to that point. One thing that's quite important is that the Raspberry Pi, I didn't know this actually until uh, I built Linux <laughs> Scratch, I wondered what was happening. There's there's no actual clock inside the Raspberry Pi. There's, um, so when you shut it down and power it up, um, the date is something like 1972. There's no, or whatever the epoch is for uh, Linux, um, there's no internal clock to keep a time when the Raspberry Pi is powered down. So what I'll, I plan to do is to show, I'll, I'll dive into what they call the Beyond Linux from Scratch, which is, which is a, another book that augments the Linux from Scratch system. And in, in that book, the BLFS book, it shows how to build additional packages and even a GUI and so on, um, and you know, word processing packages and spreadsheets and web browsers to, to build up a full desktop system. So I'll be going into that to build the um, NTP server so that when we boot the Raspberry Pi in Linux from scratch, it will connect to a time server and update the time immediately. Um, uh, the reason why that's quite important is that if you do, well, obviously if you do anything, the time is going to be wrong. But also if you compile with the time wrong, you'll get warnings about clock skew um, and warnings that it could cause problems with compilation. So if you do decide to take your... Um, LFS operating system any further and you do want to compile any more packages which you probably will want to do um, that obviously gets around that problem if we can ensure that the time is set correctly every time the machine boots up it saves us having to do it manually um, another thing I'll show is that by default the Raspberry Pi um, the clock speed defaults to a what they call a power save mode where the clock is set to 600 megahertz so consequently it means when you boot up Linux from scratch the Raspberry Pi seems quite slow when you're compiling and it hit through me for a while I was doing some tests and thinking oh why is this so slow I uh, realized that um, it, like I say it defaults this power save mode so I'll show you how we can change that to um, performance mode which puts it back to the maximum 1.8 gigahertz speed on all the cores and you get the performance back so yep yeah, like I say I'll be apart from just what's in this book I'll be taking it a little bit beyond that at the end just to just to give you a bit more of a usable system at the end because when you build Linux from scratch first time, if you just follow what's in the Linux from scratch, it can be quite daunting. You just ended up with this machine that boots the prompt and think, well, yeah, what do I do with this now? Um, it'd be nice to be able to get get the machine to do something a little bit, a little bit different. Having said that, it's obviously a, a good base for building another Linux from scratch system. So if you do take a copy of your Linux from scratch system at that point, you can always use that as a basis for another build in the future. So this page has just got some updates. Um, what's what package has been updated since pre updated since the previous release? So generally, there's a core set of packages that get updated regularly, and there's some that don't get updated so often. Um, it's not that they're not maintained; they're probably getting mature, and there's only a few bugs being found, or there's no more functionality that can be added. Um, so it's not necessarily a bad thing that not all packages get updated. 
So there's a list of all the changes since the last update. So it's probably not that interesting if you've uh, not built Linux from scratch before. Then there's a page here with resources if you want help or further information. It lists um, where you can go. So um, uh, while I can try and help you, um, if you do have problems on the channel, my time is limited. Um, and due to well, apparent success of videos, I'm, I'm getting more and more questions and it's taking up more and more time. And unfortunately, I might have to start um, sort of saying, you know, I'm unable to answer some questions. But at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm more than prepared to answer questions. But um, don't, don't take offence if I don't answer your question. Um, it's not that I'm unable to. It's more to do with time. Um, doing these videos does take a great deal of time up. Um, so, yeah, like I said, don't be offended if I don't answer. It's not a personal thing. Um, and it could be that I've already answered the question maybe somewhere else on the channel or that it is available, for example, on this FAQ that they've got on the LFS site. Um, or you can subscribe to the mailing list and answer questions. Generally, if you've had a problem, somebody else has had the problem. Um, so just put like the details of your error into Google and the chances are that um, there's a web page somewhere where somebody's asked the question. Um, I found there's several websites that come up regularly. Um, certainly the Stack Overflow one, although those sort of websites, that, that elk, um, Reddit as well comes up occasionally. So, yeah, there's there's loads of places to get help, and like I say, uh, I'm prepared to help, but um, don't don't expect me to answer straight away. I don't regularly go on there to read um, but uh, I will answer but you probably get a quicker answer by going to one of these other resources um, if you're in a hurry so again there's some more um, links for help here um, what to do if you have problems how to report errors so as it says here's an example of an error here don't just report the bottom line um, you need to report a little bit more going back because there's usually a lot more information going back beyond the, the last few lines. 